can we find examples of prolonged bipedal locomotion among primates today? As we've seen, it's actually very uncommon in the wild, but there is one primate which does it often. Proboscis monkeys live in the swamps of Borneo and regularly cross stretches of water on two legs for considerable distances. Proboscis monkeys have several peculiarities apart from their proboscis. In all other primate species, females carry their young on their backs, but in proboscis monkeys, the infant clings to its mother's chest. Bipedal wading in the swamps becomes obligatory for females with young. The proboscis monkey is not habitually bipedal though. On land, it's always quadrupedal. Gorillas are occasionally bipedal too. They're bipedal for display, sentinel behavior, or food gathering, but this is almost always postural or stationary bipedalism. They only move bipedally when crossing water. As every anthropologist knows, behavior doesn't fossilize. We have no proof that humans acquired their bipedal gait in a semi-aquatic environment. But there are examples of contemporary primates behaving in ways that allow us to conclude that it's at least a possibility. Another major difference between humans and chimpanzees is our lack of fur, our nakedness. This is what a naked chimpanzee looks like. She's suffering from alopecia, an otherwise harmless hair loss condition thought to be the result of stress. But apart from animals with a disease, where else do we find nakedness among mammals? With two exceptions, Every naked mammal on the planet is aquatic to some degree. Whales, dolphins, walruses, and manatees, and certain seals are naked. Animals like the hippo, elephant, tapir, rhinoceros, and pig all have a well-documented evolutionary history of semi-aquatic adaptation, and they all still swim well and enthusiastically. The exceptions are the Somalian naked mole rat and man. The naked mole rat spends its entire life cycle underground in narrow tunnels and never voluntarily comes to the surface. No one has yet suggested that the origins of our nakedness lie in a subterranean phase. Not every aquatic or semi-aquatic mammal is naked. The smaller ones like otters, beavers, muskrats and peccaries have fur, even though it causes more drag in the water than being naked. Size has an influence on the mechanism used to conserve heat in water and the cutoff point is just about the size of Lucy, an adult body weight of around 80 to 100 pounds. A capybara at 80 pounds has fur, a taper at 150 pounds is naked. Infant tapers have fur which they shed as they get larger. Not only is our nakedness different than all other primates, but our skin structure is different too. Our skin, not counting the subcutaneous fat, which we'll return to shortly, is much thicker than that of any other primate. It's also crisscrossed with tiny creases which show the tethering of the skin to the subcutaneous fat. No other primate has this, but it is found in aquatic and semi-aquatic mammals. Let's consider the feature which prompted Alistair Hardy's Eureka moment, our adipose tissue. Even the thinnest of us humans are enormously fat compared to other primates. Most primate species have no problem being healthy and reproducing with a body fat level of just 2%. In average adult men, who are neither obese nor professional athletes, a healthy proportion of body fat is roughly 12 to 17 percent of body weight. In women, it's between 15 and 25 percent. A woman with less than 17 percent body fat will cease menstruating and will be unable to conceive. An average human contains about 10 times as many fat cells as most terrestrial mammals of similar size. If we compare a human baby with infants of any other ape species, it's clear that fatness is not part of our primate heritage. Where else do we find naturally fat animals? Two classes of mammals accumulate large amounts of fat. Hibernating mammals, like bears, badgers and squirrels, and aquatic ones. There's no suggestion that we have a heritage of hibernation, so the closest parallel is aquatic. Both marine and freshwater mammals have a higher proportion of body fat than their nearest non-aquatic relatives. Fat is a much more efficient insulator against heat loss in water than fur, but in air it's the reverse. 
Small water animals, like beavers, retain their fur because their size prevents them from accumulating a thick enough fat layer to provide adequate insulation. Above a certain size, though, fat is a vastly superior insulator in water, and that's why the 80-pound capybara has fur and the 150-pound taper is naked. Fat in terrestrial mammals is mostly accumulated in the internal body cavities around the heart, kidneys, and intestines. But in aquatic animals, it's mostly subcutaneous, as it is in humans. In most terrestrial mammals, the skin slides loosely over the underlying structures because it's not bonded to subcutaneous fat. In humans and in aquatic animals, or ex-aquatic animals like the pig, the skin is firmly bonded to the underlying fat. Fat adds buoyancy in water. Human babies are so fat they're able to float unaided. While fur with its trapped air pockets keeps a land animal, both warm or cool, depending on the circumstances, an extensive subcutaneous fat layer is only good for staying warm. In a hot terrestrial environment, it won't help an animal keep cool, and because of the additional weight, it actually increases the amount of heat generated by muscles. For an animal that's supposed to have evolved on the hot, dry African savanna, this seems a distinct disadvantage. Now, let's consider the physiology of our fluid and electrolyte management. Humans are more wasteful of water and salt than any other land mammal. We have to drink far more than other mammals, even in the absence of exercise or heat. Dehydration of 10% in humans is often fatal, whereas many animals can withstand 20% dehydration without problem. Humans have abundant sweat and tears, saturated expiration, dilute urine, watery feces, and a low drinking capacity. These are all features suggesting that man evolved in an environment where water was permanently and abundantly available. The African savanna, by contrast, where traditional theories suggest we evolved, is an arid place where both water and salt are often scarce. It seems odd that we would be so profligate with resources so essential to life if we'd evolved in that environment. Let's consider another one of our very unusual features, breath control. In all vertebrates, including humans, breathing is automatic. Under normal circumstances, it requires no conscious control. The need to breathe in and out in all mammals is controlled by the brain's response to rising blood levels of carbon dioxide. In most mammals and all other primates, as soon as the carbon dioxide level reaches the necessary threshold, the brain automatically triggers an inspiration. They have no ability to consciously postpone breathing. Asking a chimpanzee to take a deep breath in and hold it would be comparable to a doctor asking a human patient to slow down the heart rate or sweat into a bottle. Diving animals, mammals, birds, and reptiles, as we might expect, have excellent conscious control of breathing. They can suppress the urge to breathe for limited periods. Humans are not especially good at overriding this urge compared to, say, whales, but relative to most land animals, we're exceptional. The breath-holding ability of a trained human diver is not dissimilar to that of a semi-aquatic like an otter or beaver. The ability to override carbon dioxide has some other benefits besides being able to dive. It's mandatory for the control of speech. The descended larynx, another of our very unusual features, found predominantly in aquatic animals, is not, but it does allow an extended range of sounds. Now I invite you to think about sex. It used to be believed that humans are the only animals which copulate in the face-to-face -face or ventroventral position, but this is not true. Bonobos seem to do it for fun. Orangutans do it occasionally to avoid falling out of a tree. Among gorillas and chimpanzees, it's known but not common. Among aquatic mammals, ventroventral sex is the usual position, and for a good reason. Their external organs, the ears and vagina for example, are retracted or covered either for streamlining or waterproofing. The human vagina is more internal than in apes, and is covered by labia majora, which are absent in apes. Perhaps for the same reason, the existence of a hymen is common among aquatic mammals, but not among primates. Bipedalism in humans altered the angle of the spine and pelvis, and therefore changed the angle of the vagina relative to the legs, making it more accessible from the front than from the back. Penis size in humans is greater than in most primates. A 500-pound gorilla has a 1.5-inch penis when erect. A chimpanzee might weigh 200 pounds, but has a 3-inch penis, 
while in humans the average is 6 inches. Bonobos are a species which use sex to reduce tension between individuals of both sexes. Relative to their size, they're significantly well endowed. Why does a human male have such a long penis? Many theories have been proposed. For display to females. For intimidation of other males. To cement the pair bond, which I suppose means to increase sexual satisfaction in the female and thereby keep her coming back for more. The aquatic ape theory suggests that the human penis grew longer for the same reason as a giraffe's neck, to reach something that was otherwise inaccessible. Humans have many other features which are unique among primates. In all primates except humans, the nostrils point forward or to the side, but in us they point down towards the chin. Elaine Morgan suggested that our downward-facing nostrils help to prevent water being forced into the nose when the head is underwater. We're the only primate with a nasal bone, which is why our noses have a bridge that projects forward, and that too may have developed for streamlining in water. Human fetuses, alone among primates, are born covered in a waxy secretion called vernix caseosa, which is produced shortly before birth. In a semi-aquatic environment, its purpose may have been waterproofing. Human mothers seem to feel surprisingly comfortable giving birth in water, something that no other primate would ever do. In fact, humans are the only apes that actually love water. Even proboscis monkeys don't usually play, mate, or socialize in water. We arrange our cities around water, we flock to the beaches for recreation, and we pay extra for real estate that has a view of it. We swim for pleasure, not from necessity. There are many, many ways in which our physiology differs from apes. For every difference, there are a myriad of theories purporting to explain them, none of them provable. It certainly seems logical that many of our specialized features might have developed, at least within the bounds of reasonable possibility, as adaptations to a semi-aquatic environment. Elaine Morgan's view of our evolution is without doubt the challenger against the prevailing theory of savanna-based evolution which has the support of the majority of evolutionary scientists. Perhaps, to cite a widely used pun on the subject, this is because her theory doesn't hold water. But it may also be because the scientific establishment, like almost every other sphere of human endeavor, resists change, especially if asked to question a standard hypothesis that has been almost universally recognized for over a century. Since neither theory is what most scientists would consider provable, the preference for one over the other seems hardly more than a matter of taste, and the authority of the many against the few. The aquatic ape theory may be completely, partly, or not at all accurate. At this point, there simply isn't enough undisputed evidence to confirm or refute it. In the last ten years, Elaine Morgan, who is now ninety and still lives in Wales, has been awarded honorary doctorates from two British universities. She's had a building named after her at the University of Glamorgan in Wales, and has received an OBE, an Order of the British Empire, from the Queen. She's been invited to address the Oxford Anthropological Society, and was awarded the prestigious Saugstad Prize in Sweden for her contribution to scientific knowledge. Today, very few people would label her, as my anatomy teacher did, a crazy woman.